Good morning, everybody. You got Louis Lowe here welcoming everyone to Venture Capital Term Sheets uh, 101. Yes, you are in the right place. Uh, and with me this morning are, are my good friends, Nicole Hatcher and uh, Vitaly Galam. And we've got a great program for you. Before we get started, I just want to say uh, this is attorney advertising. We are not your attorneys. This is not legal advice. Past results achieved are not a guarantee of future performance. And this is attorney advertising. There it is. Um, now with that disclaimer out of the way, uh, Vitaly, please introduce yourself. Vitaly Golem here, managing partner of GS Capital. Uh, we are a broker dealer investment bank and we help companies raise capital. We help companies sell themselves. We help big companies buy startups and we do corporate venture advisory. Uh, previously, I was a founding partner of HP Tech Ventures, a corporate venture arm of Hewlett Packard. And before that, I wore out all of my, all the knees on my jeans, uh, raising money as an entrepreneur for about 16 years. So I've, been, <laughs> I've, been, I've been all sides of the table and uh, th this is one of my favorite topics. So uh, thanks for having me, Louis. Uh, well, thanks for joining. And it's, uh, it's very timely given uh, what we're seeing in the data and in the markets. And uh, to join us and, and help us interpret some of that, I've asked my good friend and longtime colleague, Nicole Hatcher to join us. Uh, Nicole, please introduce yourself. Hi, thank you, Louie. I am Nicole Hatcher, um, founding partner of Allen & Hatcher. Louie and I go way back to our Cooley and DLA days, and now um, we work together on all sorts of fun corporate projects. So um, startup work, a lot of startup work, a lot of sales, mergers and acquisitions, and a lot of financings, um, both safes, a lot of safes, a lot of notes, and then of course, um, venture capital financings. Um, thank you, Nicole. And I'm Louis Lowe. Uh, as many of you know, I, I'm a, a longtime Silicon Valley lawyer, local boy, grew up in the East Bay, and uh, I helped uh, startups uh, get form finance skills for growth, bought and sold, and uh, I help investors do smart deals. Uh, and I've been working with these two uh, folks for, for many years, and uh, I, I really welcome their insights. Um, we've put together a, a really great agenda um, if I can get the uh, these slides to work here um, to to kind of set the stage um, first on you know what's happening in the market then we wanted to talk about you know the stages of, of venture financing and what's happening in each stage we're going to talk about some of the instruments um, some of the special features of notes and safes we're going to talk about then we're going to get into the meat of uh, equity round term sheets and and uh, what's market and what you need to be uh, looking out for. Um, and we'll close out with some, some notes about side letters and collaboration agreements, which is what we see a lot from corporate venture investors who are increasingly an important piece of the ecosystem. And in fact, uh, I think the NVCA just released some data, Vitaly, that corporate venture deals are, were, were uh, components of more than half of priced equity rounds uh, in the second quarter. And as a former uh, corporate venture capitalists, I look forward to you uh, sharing your um, insights onto that side of the table and then the other side uh, being the, the person with uh, holes in the knees of your jeans uh, when you talk to those folks. Um, uh, we, we do have a Q&A feature, everyone, and really we want to make this a, uh, an iterative discussion and, and interactive and it makes it more fun. So please uh, jump on the, uh, the Q&A function and drop in your questions. If they're relevant to exactly what we're talking about at that moment in time, um, my good friend Kate Mamiko Golomb is going to try and uh, interrupt us. Otherwise, she's going to moderate a discussion uh, of those questions at the end. Um, so thanks, uh, Kate, for, uh, for looking out for the Q&A and for, for everyone joining. Now, we had 350 registrants for this webinar. And as I was looking at it prior to uh, turning the, the record button on, I saw that there were a lot of entrepreneurs, maybe people that are looking to raise money for the very first time. And I saw a lot of um, really experienced VCs. And so it's going to be a bit of a challenge for Nicole and Natalia and I to um, speak to uh, you know people that are learning about this for the first time, as well as those who maybe are looking for the, the latest uh, and greatest nugget about how to do this uh, smarter and better. Um, but as we kick off, um, Vitaly, I thought it'd be great if you could give us an introduction to what the Money Tree CB Insights uh, report is telling us about what happened in Q2 and, and what's going on in the markets. Yeah, statistics were quite interesting as we got started in, you know, back in March uh, when we started doing these webinars to kind of help folks figure out what's going to be happening in the market as, as the pandemic really hit and a lot of nervousness came in. 
um, you know, we were nervous on what's going to happen. And what turned out is that we see a lot of opportunistic investing and uh, seed investments, uh, probably, you know, pre-revenue companies, there's probably a lot more caution in the market um, that we've seen. But companies that are considered good companies, quote unquote, that have good revenues and are in segments that are not as heavily affected, you know, they certainly got depressed valuations, but there was a lot of deal making and a lot of opportunistic uh, kind of, you know, uh, the shark smelling the blood and jumping in um, into the water uh, to do some deals. So the numbers were quite uh, good given the, the circumstance. And even beyond that, uh, what we've seen in, in Europe, it, it was actually particularly good. Uh, Europe had something like the third best quarter ever in venture capital in Q2 of this year. So quite interesting to watch. Uh, we'll see how the full year numbers look, um, but it's actually not as bad as everybody thought was going to happen. You know, you know, basically, if, you, if, you, if you've been in this for long enough and you remember Sequoia's deck of rip good times uh, back in the financial crisis, uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of you know, similarities that we're seeing and, and we were afraid that things were going to be just as bad as the financial crisis. But uh, it turned out uh, to be quite uh, surprisingly not as bad, I would say. Yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're on track to beat 2018, uh, which was a record year. So, um, uh, but I think when you look inside uh, the, the, the deals and the amount of capital deployed and the types of deals that happened, uh, Vitaly, uh, what, was this just a lot of doubling down on late stage companies or, or were there a lot of seed deals too? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, when you're looking at companies that are kind of in the middle of their, the startups that are in the middle of their life cycle, where they are, you know, they're a couple of years in, they have their first revenue, they have their first proof points and uh, product market fit, first revenue, et cetera. And again, they're not in the segments like travel, for example, that are heavily affected. Um, they just needed to, they just need additional capital to weather the storm. And as we were cautioning kind of, as we got into this again, um, right away, um, you know, they battened down the hatches, they reduced their burn, and they got into kind of cockroach mode to make sure that they survive. And everybody understands, has been around, that this is not the end of the world, that this is just a temporary thing. The question is, is it a three-month thing? Is it, an, is it a two-year thing? And you saw a lot of companies going out there and raising capital to make sure that they can weather the storm and get through it, no matter how long it is, and come out the other side stronger. Uh, if you really look at it and you kind of zoom out, uh, it is a good strategy as a former you know, founder and CEO. I can tell you that um, you, you can look at it a couple of different ways. If you are a strong company, you're going to be only stronger when you come out uh, because you're going to have less, comp less competition. Everything's going to be cheaper. Be, it's going to be easier to hire and all those things. So, um, you know, look at it that way. But you can see that uh, by the numbers and, and which rounds got most uh, funding, you can see a kind of series E plus later stage rounds had a big jump. Uh, a lot of these companies that are not quite ready to IPO, probably a year or two or more away from going to the public markets, they're raising big private rounds to make sure they get there. So that's kind of the overall trend uh, without spending too, too much time on this. Um, I would say this is probably where we're at at the moment. Uh, thanks a lot, Vitaly. And, and um, you know, one of the things we wanted to cover is just the various stages of VC financing. And, and um, as is probably obvious to all of you out there, um, you know, we really divide up the world into those funds that look at seed deals, uh, which are not the same as those who, who look at early stage deals that might be series A, uh, whereas seed, seed investors are, are really pre-series A. Um, growth stage is, is maybe series B and beyond, and then pre-IPO stage being kind of the last, the last mile. Um, any comments and thoughts about what you're seeing in the market, uh, Vitaly and Nicole, about um, each of these uh, funds and what they're doing? Nicole, maybe you want to touch this one first. Yeah, I can, I can speak to what we're seeing our companies um, and how they're raising. So we're seeing, I think, sort of less seed stage deals um, when we were seeing a lot of them sort of in the past year, year and a half, they were a lot of um, seed stages on safes and less notes, um, but just sort of a, a friends and family round. And then you had sort of funds like, you know, General Catalyst come in on seed rounds, but really just friends and family at the seed stage rounds. And then the, the early stage rounds is really where we saw um, sort of increased round sizes from what we, we saw previously at, at the Series A level. Um, and then the growth stage, I felt like that was sort of a longer stage. So where we would normally see like Series C companies 
be pre-IPO, we were seeing, you know, Series D, E, um, still raising in the growth phase. So that's what I was seeing from the company side and, and our clients that were raising money. Vitaly, you can probably speak to the fund side. You know, um, Vitaly, when I was in kindergarten, nobody tried to teach me to read. Um, but when my son went to kindergarten, suddenly, you know, first grade had become kindergarten. Yeah. Where I'm going with this is that, um, you know, seed stage used to be series A, and now it's, it's these convertible notes and safe notes. And even to get to those kinds of deals at, at the quarter million to half a million dollar check size, you've got to be showing uh, not only a minimum viable product, but you've actually got to start showing revenue. Uh, if you're a first time founder to get there and, and series A stage isn't until you've got some sort of a recurring revenue uh, over a period that, that you can demonstrate. And, and so it just feels like everything's kind of knocked back uh, around. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly with the pandemic, uh, those seed deals are getting tougher and tougher to, to, uh, to finance and, and they're, they're getting smaller and smaller is what I'm seeing. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I remember not that long ago, just a few years ago, having a, you know, convertible over a million dollars was unheard of, uh, you know, just maybe five, six, seven years ago. And now seed stages are, are quite large. You know, you really have to look at kind of the market overall. Um, I think everything's gotten compressed and stretched out at the same time. So at the earlier stages, uh, there are bigger rounds being raised to get to that proof of concept, to get to that uh, product market fit. And uh, the bar, frankly, for Series A has raised to a certain extent where you want to show first revenue, um, you want to show that the company is moving forward. Um, and that's frankly been difficult, for example, for some of our clients who are in manufacturing, right, in automotive manufacturing or related, um, you know, they can't show revenue until they build a factory. It's kind of a chicken and an egg. Uh, at the same time, companies are staying private much, much longer, and you're going to have some really interest, intricate, really interesting terms in these pre-IPO or even later growth rounds, uh, and we'll cover that at the end, uh, things like ratchets on revenue and, and all sorts of things uh, that were before you know, quite exotic um, in terms. So uh, deals are getting more complex, and I think, uh, for example, SoftBank being involved and in kind of really changing the whole model of venture because they're investing large amounts of money at later stages where before companies had to get access to public markets to, to, to raise that kind of capital. Um, that has really changed the calculus and kind of really changed the venture perspective out there. Uh, as, in result, you know, when, by the time the companies go public, they're worth tens of billions in, in quite often. And that was unheard of before. Yeah, I, I like to tell the story of the biggest Series A deal I ever did was representing NEA and General Atlantic putting in, uh, leading a round of $265 million into Automation Anywhere, which SoftBank then followed into. And you know, it just kind of redefines the category of early stage. Right. Um, but you know, the point here is that you know, know who you're talking to when you go out to uh, raise money. If, if you're, if you're pre-revenue, you don't want to go talk to a, a late stage uh, fund. Um, I, I would say the other trend we've seen over the last 10 years, and, and I'm curious if Nicole or and Vitaly, if you've seen any changes, is, is we've seen more and more money going into less and less funds. And so you have these large mega funds uh, that, that now have to adopt multi-tiered uh, strategies. So uh, the folks uh, at, at NEA and Sequoia and Excel, et cetera, have to have a separate seed program and a, and a different program for, for late stage. Um, but but um, you know, there, there, there are still lots and lots of micro seed funds always popping up, but um, I, I think they're, they're increasingly adopting very focused vertical strategies like, you know, AI or, or some, you know, sub vertical even within, within AI. So I, I think we're seeing a, a specialization within seed uh, to, to uh, kind of survive and, and differentiate. Um, you know, as we talk about the, 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 the types of, of financing we're seeing, you know, what we wanted to cover today is obviously convertible notes, safes, and, and then we're going to try and spend the, the bulk of our time um, on, on equity. And um, Nicole, you know, briefly, can you give us a, a, a quick overview on notes versus safes and the critical differences between the two? Yeah. So we, so we have two slides here um, on some of the differences. So a convertible note obviously is a debt instrument. A safe is designed not to be a debt in instrument. So on a convertible note, you'll have an interest rate and a and maturity date, which are these two first bullet points here, um, which you don't have on a safe. And 
the, the things that can be similar to uh, between a convertible note and a safe are the conversion um, discount and evaluation cap. So the safe can and often does have a, a discount and evaluation cap um, and safes just sort of go on. You, you have to terminate safes um, or if you're acquired, then you know, they, they can convert into common stock or, you get, or they get paid out. Um, but there's no sort of maturity date in a safe like there is with a, a convertible note. And on the maturity date in the, the convertible note, that's when all interest and principal is due or you have to convert the note. Um, so a lot of times you'll spend some resources if, you, if the company is not ready to convert the note to extend the maturity date. Um, and so you'll have to get consent and you'll have to sort of think about that where you don't have the same consideration with a safe. I think that was, you, you, you really hit the, the, the hammer on the head there that, you know, these convertible notes and safes were invented to be kind of a very quick uh, 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 instrument that wouldn't be outstanding for a long time that you'd, historically, those would quickly get converted into a series A within a year or two. And now you're seeing, you know, companies yeah. staying in the seed, in the seed stage for a longer and longer period of time running leaner and leaner. Yeah pivoting and you know we have this problem where convertible notes stay outstanding and maybe they've matured yeah uh, uh, maybe a conversion trigger has hit but nobody actually has exercised it or or i find that discussions or even emails have been exchanged about the topic but there wasn't like an official notice yeah. so it can be a mess yeah, in exactly. the short story. and, and uh, having a good team to stay on top of it and make sure that um, you know you're staying ahead of it um, and, and, and nourishing these things as they go. Um, the next thing I would say is, is um, if a convertible note or a safe's been outstanding a long time and there's a discount or interest, you know, that's accumulating over time. Yeah. And, you know, your later investors may not be okay with, with, uh, with the amount of dilution that would, that would be triggered. And if you're an entrepreneur, maybe you yourself shouldn't be okay uh, with the amount of, uh, dilution that that will that will happen and so i'm finding that at the series a round you you oftentimes need to go back to the convertible note holders or the safe holders um, and, and and have a chat with them about about what's fair um, often you know even more you're seeing these aqua hires happen uh, where companies never make it out of seed stage and they get acquired and, and they're in the same circumstance where they've got these notes and safes that um, have different terms may say maybe some of them matured or not or there was a conversion or there wasn't and cleaning that up uh, is, is can be a mess uh, if, if you haven't uh, been on top of it. If I can add just something to this, I mean, just to remind everybody uh, and kind of inform the ones that don't know, uh, convertible note originally wasn't really designed for this intent. It was it was really kind of a stopgap where a company needed some capital to keep going between rounds, and it was it was started to be used by uh, by early stage investors because you know for simple reason that you don't really have to haggle over valuation of the company at those first stages when it's very difficult so you kind of postpone this so one question we have is you know what does safe stand for and safe stands for standard agreement for future equity or simple agreement for future equity mm -hmm. and um, and with the safe you take out something that doesn't really belong in this kind of early stage like early stage you invest in a company you're not really giving them a loan right if you want to give them a loan there's there's an easier way to do that um, so the interest is really eliminated from that. You, you kind of make a binary bet. You either believe in this company and it's going to win or it doesn't and doesn't get on, to, doesn't get to the next round to play, you know, in the, in the equity game. And then of course the, um, the term, uh, if you have a set term at the beginning, that's when it gets really contentious because more often than not companies go longer, um, until they next uh, raise the next round and those convertibles term out and, um, you know, it, it doesn't really benefit the, uh, the investors to be really, um, you know, to, re to be too aggressive about this and try to stick to the term and, and force the company into liquidation just to pay them back on that convertible note. So um, I like the safe as a much, it's a much better fit for this kind of purpose for these early stage rounds. On the other hand, from the investor perspective, neither are really uh, that great because they don't provide any kind of um, any kind of uh, downside protection, right? You, you're not a shareholder until that next round happens and the conversion happens from the safe or convertible note into real equity and real stock in the company. Yeah, I, I think you're right that a, a convertible note, even though it does have a a, 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 much, a principal amount, so you, you're supposedly having some downside protection, Vitaly. If the company goes bust, it's not like uh, you're really ever going to be able to recover that amount. So 
I agree with you that it, there, there's not really a lot of downside protection, number one. And then number two, if you do get to exit, you know, a buyer can always require you to take a, a different amount than, uh, than your principal amount. Um, you know, before we get off the topic of, of safes and notes, you know, and, and flip into the main topic, which is equity, you know, I, I, I wanted to call out that, you know, the NVCA has put out a new equity term sheet form as well as a new suite of, of uh, form documents on their website. They did it on in mid-July, which was one of the uh, uh, triggers for us uh, deciding to, to tackle this topic. And in the back of their standard form term sheet, they've published some statistics for the first time in partnership with a group called uh, AUMNI, who um, um, analyzed, I guess, all of the uh, 35,000 uh, venture deals that had been uploaded into the various commercial databases. And, and they shared some stats uh, on the median and average discounts on safes and convertible notes, as well as um, caps. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's always hard to know what is the sample set and whether how much is tech versus life science and whether you should look at these and th think of them as representative. But Nicole and Vitaly, what would you say are kind of the standard, um, you know, pre-revenue discounts and, and caps that you're seeing on, on notes and safes? And maybe Nicole, I'll start with you to put you on the spot. Yeah, so I think the standard discount I see in a safe is 20%. Um, that seems to be what I see a lot for, for our clients. The, the valuation cap is kind of all over the place. I, I think it depends on the strength of the company. Sometimes there's no valuation cap and there's just the discount. Um, but the valuation cap, I think, is really where the company, what the company considers their value at the time um, of the safe. and so those I see all over the board, anywhere from if it's a super early stage safe, I've seen valuation caps as low as $2 million. Um, but we're doing, a, that's on the very low end. Uh, but now I'm seeing a lot more where we're doing valuation caps of 18 million, 20 million. Um, it's just sort of all over the place. Yeah, and people confuse a lot the, the cap on valuation as the valuation. And I yeah. want to remind everybody, it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I would also say that the data is showing us that the discounts on safes are a lot bigger uh, than on convertible notes. And I'm working on one right now where the discount's 50%. Um, and, you know, folks aren't shy about, about saying so. And they, they, this is really highly high risk capital and, and they think they should get a, uh, a, a bigger return. And um, it's frustrating when, when you're, uh, when you've done many rounds and you, you look at the cap table and you see that, you know, the, the person who's put in the small, written the big, the smallest check size maybe has the largest equity stake. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you can have some, some weird results. Um, but uh, with that, I think we should flip into the, uh, to the meat of our discussion about um, equity term sheets. And um, uh, Louis, I'm sorry if you let me interrupt. We have two more questions about safes and I was thinking it would be appropriate to answer them. So the first one is uh, what kind of uh, board of director or observer rights typically come with safes? And the second one is uh, why the discount on safes typically lower than convertible notes? Thank you. Nicole, you want to take that? Yeah, I can take the first one. Um, so board of director observer rights are not automatically in the safe. Those are negotiated terms. I, I rarely see a safe investor get a board seat. Um, I will sometimes see investors get observer rights either through the standard NBCA management's rights letter um, that they send over or just in a side letter that we'll talk about later. Um, but I would say it's it's pretty common to get observer rights with with the safe, um, because especially if you have a venture fund that's putting the safe in. It's less common if you have you know just friends and family putting a safe in. Um, but it it is pretty common, but less common for an actual board seat. And then Louis, I think you can take the. I think the second question is directed to you on why are the discount on safes typically lower than convertible notes. I think it's the other way around and the data shows us that the, the discounts on safes are, are, are getting bigger. And I would say that there's still a little bit of a divide between East and West Coast. West Coast, I think the convertible note is gone and it's almost entirely moved towards the safe. 
um, which is a you know an almost unnegotiated document, uh, other than you know the 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 terms that you fill in the blank on discount and, and conversion and whether you have the side letter or not. Um, the the East Coast, you know, you still have a lot of investors who say, oh no, I want a convertible note and and you know push on that. And uh, those are the the same investors who are probably looking for companies that have a little bit more. Uh, uh, Proof or indicia of success, and so I, I think that um, you know you're you're seeing safes for earlier stage companies, convertible notes uh, for later stage companies in the seed round, and, and uh, I, I'm seeing bigger discounts for safes just because the 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 risk on on that capital being lost is just so much greater. I don't know, Vitaly, if you have a different perspective. I, I think that's accurate. I mean, in the convertible note, you also get interest, right? So in the, in the safe, you don't. So that, that's probably one of the reasons. Uh, but really, it's kind of how, you know, the, the temperature of the waters that you're swimming in and, and it kind of ebbs and flows. And if you have active angel investors that are looking at a lot of deals, they're basically just going to look at kind of what the averages were, the trends are going and, and kind of go by feel. It's, it, I would say it's more art than, than a science. Same thing for CAPS. You know, it's kind of negotiated. You kind of squint and, and look at, you know, what does this company look like? You know, it's a, this for that. And is it a strong team? Do they have exits? You know, that's kind of if I put on my venture capitalist hat. The other thing uh, keep in mind is uh, back to the first question as far as board directors or observers, really at seed stage when we're talking about a uh, convertible or safe round, there's really no board. There's no formal board. What you do want to negotiate if you're on the other side of the table as an angel investor, and I, I don't know how many from the call are here, that fit that profile, but you want information rights and you want to preserve those information rights and you want pro rata rights. And we'll dig more into that in a second. But even at that, uh, at that level, you can negotiate a side letter that kind of carves out these special rights. The information rights means that, you know, every quarter you would get a report from the company. And generally you want to invest in entrepreneurs that will keep all their investors well informed on at least a monthly basis. But with information rights, you have a formal, uh, right to get information about the company and as they move on to next rounds and all of a sudden you're a small fish to them when they deal with their venture investor you still get information about the company you're informed on how they're doing what they're doing etc so there there's a key there's there are some key things that i would advise you to look for when you structure these deals uh, and that's probably beyond the conversation we have today I think we probably ought to keep moving, but uh, I think there's a lot of great advice there about how to keep your uh, seed investors informed and excited about the company uh, with regular reports. And I, I totally agree with you, uh, Vitaly, that that's a smart thing to do. But let's dive into the meat of our topic here, folks, uh, equity round term sheets. Um, as I said at the outset, you know, one of the uh, triggers for us to, uh, picking this uh, topic today is that the NVCA uh, General Counsel Advisory Board released a whole suite of uh, new NVCA form documents uh, on July 14th. And, you know, quick, quick introduction to those forms. They are written by the lawyers for invest, uh, venture capitalists. Uh, and, and they're written by lawyers' lawyers. Um, so they're incredibly investor friendly. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is um, they are written by the, the, the lawyers for domestic institutional venture capital firms. So uh, they're not typically receiving input from the, the many non-US investors that we see, particularly in the Silicon Valley from Asia. Um, uh, I'm talking about SoftBank, I'm talking about all the, the great funds out of Korea or Hong Kong um, or, or um, uh, Japan. And, and so, um, you know, when, when you look at those, you, you, you should understand the bias from which um, they're written. And I don't, I wouldn't accuse anyone of a bias, but just the, the lens from which those folks uh, um, view the world. And now I've just gotten, I'm going to get some hate mail from my my friends who are VCGCs of uh, local funds, but uh, they're, they're really smart documents. They, they've got a lot of hyperlinks to um, background material that I think is really useful. And, and I think the main innovation that they've tried to introduce is how to respond to uh, the new rules on CFIUS, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and which uh, requires uh, that that any um, uh, investment into a company that's a U.S. company or a company that's using the instruments of, of uh, interstate commerce uh, in the United States 
um, uh, that invest that is developing or marketing or selling technology uh, that touches on 27 uh, critical uh, areas of national security, which you should all interpret to, to mean until a lawyer tells you differently. Uh, CFIUS is covered, and if you ha receive investment uh, from a non-U.S. person. Uh, you need to Im involve uh, somebody who can interpret uh, how to comply with CFIUS and, and the term sheet uh, innovations and the, the innovations within the new form documents attempt to do that. Um, so with that long disclaimer um, uh, out of the way, uh, Nicole, I wondered if you could just start taking us through some of the, you know, the, the base terms in, in, a, in a Series A long form term sheet from the MDCA. Yeah. So the pre-money valuation, and I'm sure Vitaly will, will have more insight on this, but that is the, the valuation that the company and the investor, the lead investor, come up with. Um, I don't have as much insight into how they come up with that number, so maybe Vitaly, you can speak on that. But the post-money valuation is essentially the pre-money valuation plus the, the raise, so how much cash investment you're taking in, um, in the round. Um, so the, the pre-money plus this investment amount should equal the post-money valuation. And then subsequent closings are a period of time after your initial closing where you can take additional investment up to your round size. So if your round size is $15 million and your lead is putting in, you know, seven and a half, then you, you have uh, usually 90 days to raise the rest of the money that's not coming in in the initial closing. Sometimes those get extended, but you you really should have um, yeah, plenty of time to, to finish out the round. The option pool is a negotiated, um, is, it, is a negotiated amount. So I've seen anywhere from on the lower end, you know, four, six percent of an option pool increase because investors want an available pool so it doesn't dilute them later. And this option pool amount is generally included in the pre-money capitalization. So it's only diluting existing investors. Um, so anywhere from 4% up to 15%, um, depending on the company's hiring plans, where they are, if they're early stage, later stage, um, if they're growth, there's a lot of sort of negotiation and, and thought that goes into what the available pool should be when you are, um, when you're negotiating that. Thanks, Nicole. And, and um, I would just add that, you know, a critical thing to add to your, to your term sheet is a pro forma cap table uh, as an yeah. exhibit on the back where you know all of the the numbers are are footed so that you really understand what your pre money valuation is and and how it's being deducted for um, your option pool, if that's the case, whether whether it's existing or the new amount of increase, which typically an investor will require, um, you, you want to make sure that it's encapsulating whatever convertible notes exactly. and discounts and caps and safes that have the same features in it. And sometimes, you know, companies will want to make their round look bigger by including uh, the convertible note and the safe in the investment amount. Um, so it's important to kind of look through those numbers and really understand what is being put where and, and that you have a pro forma cap table. So everyone is on the same page about what you're going to be worth post closing. And, you know, for those entrepreneurs out there, you know, you've got to, you've got to look at what you're going to have on a fully diluted basis uh, post closing and look a few rounds out and, and think about, you know, where you're going to be and whether that works. And, you know, I, I guarantee you that investors are doing the same thing and, um, you know, they want to make sure that you're going to have a sufficient incentive uh, to stick around. And if they don't think that either they might pass on the investment altogether or they might require, you know, a recap of, of the cap table. Anything to add from your perspective, Vitaly, particularly on how companies are establishing what their pre-money valuation is? Yeah, let me put a strategic layer on this cake. Um, so uh, the important thing is when you're raising from entrepreneur perspective is that you want to anchor the valuation to pre-money, right? So it's, it's what you're coming to the table with, how much the company is worth before any money comes in, before any options pool and other bells and whistles go on top. Um, if you anchor your raise to post money, everything gets deducted from that, right? And, and you're the one getting diluted. Um, it's incredibly important to have a very accurate pro forma cap table, as Louis mentioned. I'm going to reemphasize that. Uh, this is when people make a lot of mistakes. 
that can be costly later and can create lawsuits because you're going to have, you know, in the perfect world, you're going to have one round of safes and they're all going to look the same. But in practice, you're going to have a bunch of different safes, convertible notes, founders put in money that they expected back, et cetera. You want to put all of that and discuss it openly with your investors and make sure everybody's on the same page and there are no surprises um, that all of that's in place. So this is where your attorneys will be very helpful in reading through all the documents, making sure that all the calculations, all the timing, all the conversions, everything is done properly um, as you're working on this and, and very much cook in that pro forma uh, cap table into all the discussions. So there's that. Um, the investment amount, subsequent closings, you want to keep your options open if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a lead investor coming in and doing the first closing, that's, that's really the way you wanna do it. You want to go out then to everybody else you talk to and see how much more money you can raise. Uh, my guidance always is raise as much money within reason as you can, uh, because you, all, you can always use it. You always need that safety net. The very incremental dilution you'll take by raising a bit more than you expected um, is a really good insurance policy. And then the options pool, my best explanation for this is, you know, you're going to haggle a little bit, but the way to do it properly is to look at your hiring plan through the next round and understand how much equity you're going to have to give away to especially management, you know, experienced people they're going to bring on, on, on the team that may take in each case between, you know, quarter point and uh, quarter percent and, you know, two, 3%, depending on who you're hiring, that's going to add up pretty quickly. So you want to make sure that you've accounted for that. Uh, from the investor perspective, if I'm a VC, I'm going to ask, you know, kind of by default say, okay, let's great. Let's put a 20% option pool, but it's going to be, that's going to be a, one of the points to, that, that are key to negotiate and kind of prove your yeah. point as an entrepreneur and say, here is our equity budget until the next round, because here's our hiring plan. And you kind of want to anchor it to a real value rather than, you know, a just in case big number, like 20%. So that's, that's what I'll say on this. Yeah, and I'd, I'm going to add just uh, two more layers on top of your strategic layer, uh, Vitaly, on this cake. Um, one on subsequent closings. Um, if you've got a non-U.S. investor that's going to have to go through CFIUS, uh, that is going to take a heck of a lot more than 90 days to go get done. So you you may or may not need more than 90 days to to close the even the first closing, uh, not to mention subsequent closings. And so you know you really need to to take a look at that um, and and make sure that it works, as particularly if if you have. Uh, existing non-U.S. investors that you'd like to have take their pro rata and come in on a subsequent basis. Um, the next point I wanted to make about the option pool is, you know, a lot of uh, entrepreneur friends of mine will get really exercised. What, what do you mean I need a 20% option pool? I, 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 I've got everybody I need. And, and um, you know, the answer is, is um, you'll know uh, a year into it how this is working out. And um, if you don't need all those people and you've given away a lot of equity to your your, uh, your preferred investors and you're doing really well, you can always have some of those options granted to you, in other words, a top up. So um, I don't uh, see a lot of downside to having a, a healthy sized um, equity pool. And in fact, uh, I see only uh, upside for uh, uh, entrepreneurs on that score. Um, you know, to, to keep moving and, and on pace with all the topics that we have, we could, we could spend uh, an hour on valuation itself. Um, Nicole, what are you seeing on, on governance and, and what should you be on the lookout for in, on a term sheet? Yeah, so for your first, your, your Series A or sometimes even your Series C, if it is an equity round, um, generally your investor will want a board seat. At that time, if you only have one lead, you're likely only going to give up one, one board seat. Um, so we're seeing you know, one investor director and maybe two common directors. Um, what I've seen is as the investor director, the number increases, so do the common directors until it starts to sort of even out and then eventually there will be more investor directors than common directors um, in, in later stage companies. And that's sort of what I'm seeing for the board structure on voting rights and so vote, voting rights we see obviously your preferred um, stockholders have a set of protective provisions in your charter and those protective provisions say hey you can't take certain actions without going out to the preferred stockholders and getting their consent and those thresholds are set sort of based on the what the round looks like so if there's one lead investor it's probably going to be a majority of the preferred 
Um, but if there are a lot of convertible note holders and lots of shadow series and a majority of the preferred doesn't work out um, in the lead investor's favor, it could be 60% of the preferred, 75% depends on the, the round structure um, and how many, how many uh, raises you've done. There's also board specific voting rights so that the, the preferred directors have to approve certain things that the board votes on. So those would be generally in your investor rights agreement. Um, you can, as Louis mentioned, the NBCA document, form documents has a list of what those uh, actions are. And for information rights, we see just standard rights to financial information, um, rights to inspect the company's books and records, uh, but it's really the financials that most investors um, want to receive on some regular cadence. Hey, and thanks for that. Vitaly, thoughts? Yeah, quick quick add to this. Uh, just kind of my preference and what I've seen that works best. First of all, mm -hmm. uh, you, you always want to have an odd number of board members. Um, <laughs> that's very important. And um, I actually like to structure as early as possible, as soon as the board is formed, to have outside uh, board members that kind of really... Um, they really kind of neutralize uh, any kind of uh, preferences, where the, whether it's management, whether it's investors, because investors have their own lens on the company and their own uh, set of circumstances and, and, um, and influence that they're going to have on the company. If they're late in their fund, they're going to push for exit earlier than the management might want, for example. There's all sorts of, um, you know, gamesmanship that goes into this. And... Um, you know, it's really important to have that neutrality to really watch out for the company and all board members have fiduciary duty to the company first and foremost. Uh, but uh, you, you can have kind of conflicting responsibilities and, and interests, certainly. So that's that's what I would add to this. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the other thing is, is having outside directors tends to lend more formality to the board meeting. So if you have directors that are only inside the company, it, it tends to, they go a while without board me meetings. They don't put the effort into it. Um, so I, I think especially early stage companies can benefit from, from that level of formality and, and looking into their company because they have to present it to the board. Absolutely. Yeah, um, just a word about, about board control. I think at series A, um, is going to be the first time you have uh, a, an investor director in most cases uh, join the board. And, you know, it's always my advice that you avoid giving away any board seats in connection with a convertible note or a safe. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody insists, offer them an advisory board seat or something like that. Um, but but um, you've really got to think ahead because then at the Series B round and the Series C round, th those lead uh, investors are going to want a board seat and are you going to be giving away control of your company uh, con because the board is the ultimate uh, supervisor of a company and, and set, who sets the strategy and uh, hires and fires the CEO. Um, and, and so you really want to be thoughtful about, you know, who has control for how long and when, which leads me to my second point about voting rights. And we've seen in, in some you know, as recently or going back as far as uh, as 15 years ago with the, the founders of Google and, and then Zuckerberg did this and, and Spiegel did this and, and lots of folks have taken super voting rights, whether at formation or they've done it later as kind of a last step before going public to ensure uh, the founders continued influence uh, and guidance over a company once it becomes public. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, Vitaly, about whether it's a pro, you know your thoughts on what you when you see super voting rights for founders in earlier stage uh, equity term sheets versus last mile term sheets. Yeah, I mean it could be dangerous. I mean, really, a lot of times this is one way or another. It's an ego trip for the founders. Either they have a problem with authority and they they just generally want to hang on to their their baby for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. um, or they are, you know, really outstanding founders with multiple exits and they can essentially write their own ticket and choose their own investors and they're able to kind of swing the terms in their way and, you know, the investors will just accept it. So, but it's not, I wouldn't, I would say generally speaking, it's not really healthy. You want to have nice balance. Um, I don't believe in geniuses, you know, they come once in a decade uh, that truly are smarter than everybody in the room. You want that experience. You want uh, to watch out for the company. You want to be humble. 
as a founder and and you want to have the controls in place um you know there are some firms that will they'll be unnamed on this call uh, that are notorious for removing um, founder CEOs. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, you, you, even as a founder CEO, you have more gain by making sure that, you know, you know the right time to hand over the reins to watch out for your biggest asset, your company and your equity in it than being on an ego trip. So that, that's how I interpret it. Maybe it's a little bit, um, you know, a little bit skewed, but that, that's my perception on it. Nicole, what do you think? Um, I agree. We, I try to steer my clients away from uh, this kind of voting structure. It's just not, it, usually when the investor comes in, they'll have them remove it anyways, and it, you just have to revise everything. Um, and, and I agree with Vitaly that, that it can indicate that there is um, some sort of problem with authority, or they just have an unrealistic view of, of the control that they should have in their, in their company. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to disagree with you just because it's fun and, and uh, <laughs> tell you that particularly when I see a repeat founder um, who's been thrown out of his last company uh, before she was ready or he was ready, uh, I think super voting rights can be a great uh, protection through the early rounds of a company's existence. Um, but I always tell my founders that, um, you know, your super voting rights last as long as you have money. And as soon as uh, you're out of money and, and somebody with money tells you that you have to give them up, well, then, and you have no other money, well, then they're gone. Uh, so I, I think um, it, it can help uh, provide some stability uh, and, and ensure some continuity of, of, uh, of founder uh, control, at least through the, um, the early stages uh, of a company's life. Um, and it can also ensure that uh, a founder maintains board control at least through you know the a round and and perhaps um perhaps beyond and and with some founders i think that's a really important thing and with other founders i think that would be a bad thing um for for folks who have no experience for example you know this is perhaps not the right um way to go but for people who've got really a plan that's long term you know maybe maybe this is something that will help them um, execute so there i've disagreed with you both ha um, yeah. It's about vision, right? It's um, if you can get one other person to see it, it's a vision. If you can't, it's a hallucination. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's that's that's how I see it. Uh, and you know, uh, sometimes there are founders that are outstanding and they are visionaries and it, and it proves uh, through at the end. But uh, ultimately, it's yeah, absolutely right. If if you can do it, if you can get away with it, great. But don't do it uh, just because of an ego trip. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they, they threw Steve Jobs out of his company and, and had he had super voting rights, maybe that wouldn't happened. And uh, I think Google and Facebook have created uh, an enormous amounts of value despite having the, uh, the super voting rights. And so um, I, I think there's, a, there's an argument for it, which I'm only making because you all uh, made the arguments against it. Um, so there, um, thanks for uh, engaging with me on that, guys. Um, next, um, I thought we would talk about protections, uh, and, and here by protections, I mean economic protections. And uh, Nicole, why don't you uh, take us through these key terms? Yeah. So the liquidation preference is usually what a preferred stockholder will have. It means that if the company winds up um, or is sold, that they get Generally, it's, I see a lot more 1x before, I would say a few years ago, you'd see 1.5, 2x, 3x returns. Um, and that's usually before the common, well, it is before the common gets theirs. Sometimes the liquidation preferences will be stacked. So you have the Series A that gets their liquidation preference before the Series B, before the Series A. And sometimes there'll be pari passu where all of the preferred stockholders get their liquidation preferences at the same time um, on a pro rata basis before they're the, the liquidation proceeds are distributed to the holders of um, common stock. And then I, I will let Vitaly talk to you about, you know, sort of how this looks like um, when the company is doing well and, and when it isn't. Participation rights are the same thing as pro rata rights. So it's your right to participate in the next round. Um, at least I think that's what you mean by participation and not sort of participating with a common. Um, no, nope, I, I think we, we meant uh, dividends or lick preps. Okay. Okay. So then in, in respect to liquidation preferences, then 
Um, you can have most of what I see now is non-participating preferred. So the preferred stockholders get their liquidation preference and then the common holders get theirs, whatever is left over. Um, sometimes the preferred stockholders negotiate to get their liquidation preference and then they participate with the common with whatever is being distributed to the common. So as if they were converted, I would say that's not as common anymore. Um, Anti-dilution is protection against dilution as it, as it says here. So this means that you, the, the company can't go out and issue a whole bunch of shares that are below the preferred price. Um, and if they do, there are anti-dilution triggers and there's a, an entire mechanism. Um, but there are a lot of exceptions to anti-dilution for the stock plan issuing shares um, in an acquisition, for example. These are all negotiated terms, what the carve-outs to anti-dilution are. Um, issuing shares to third party service providers or joint ventures. Um, a lot of things you would want to negotiate here so that your anti-dilution provisions are not triggered every time you issue shares like common stock or anything else below the preferred price. Um, and then I will let you, I'm not as familiar with play to pays I don't see them a lot in the companies that I, that I represent. So you can probably explain those better than I can. Sure, sure. So um, just going back over the terms, uh, as you look at a company, you, you talk about the liquidation stack and the amount of preferred and who gets what, when, and what order. And uh, I think that, you know, as a, as a starting point, um, whether you're a seed preferred investor or an A or a B, um, you know, the current state of the market is that people view that as, as growth equity capital where everybody should be aligned and in the same boat. And so there isn't typically a liquidation preference of a B over an A in, in a standard circumstance in the market today, at least on the West Coast, um, in tech. Um, uh, those who do more life sciences might, might differ with me, but I, I think that that's pretty much the standard. Um, it isn't until you get to a later stage financing where, you know, a D or an E round might say, hey, I, I need to be uh, ahead of uh, the guys behind me um, uh, who invested previously. And, and obviously, um, so, so this comes up in growth and, and last mile rounds, I would say. Um, uh, same on participation, particularly for a struggling company, uh, an investor might say that they want to have, uh, a, you know, a 3x uh, return of capital, uh, or they want to participate. In other words, they get their their pr liquidation preference, and then they convert to common, and 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 then everything gets distributed out to to the common, including them. Um, Anti-dilution. I think all this means is that if there's a down round, the existing investors have to consent, and on a pay-to-play. Um, there, there are many different forms of this, but essentially, it, if you can get a majority of the of the holders of the outstanding uh, and any anybody who has a protective provision to waive, um, it's a way to recapitalize the company um, when it's not doing well. So if the liquidation stack is 100, but the company is only worth 50 and somebody wants to put in 20, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to need to convert everybody uh, in, into common potentially. Um, and to encourage the existing investors to invest, you, you'll tell them, hey, um, if, you, if you don't invest, we're going to wash your, your existing preferreds into common. And it, but if you do invest, we will um, move it up or, or um, we'll, we'll, let, we'll give you credit for it, whether it's full credit or, or partial credit. And, and so it's, um, it, it's something that lawyers can, can always concoct to um, put a gun to investors, existing investors' heads to, 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 to invest. So it's, it's pay to play uh, because if you want to keep your, your stake in the company, you've got you've to uh, put some money into the kitty. Um, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, I think we're seeing more and more of those in, uh, in late stage companies right now. Um, and frankly, they're, they're not always working. Um, anything to add on this, Vitaly, before we move on? Yeah, I'm kind of watching the clock. We're going to go over, but, um, you know, there's a four letter word associated with all this called down rounds. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's not always up and to the right. Sometimes the company gets in trouble and that's where these anti-dilution provisions come in, the pay to play where the company can get, uh, you know, the existing preferred investors, the previous investors that don't support the company when it needs most help, they can get diluted 10 to one, you know, they, they get completely wiped out and the new investors come in in their place 
and and have majority of the ownership in the company. Liquidation preference is also kind of a strategic lever that investors can pull. And when you have a disagreement or the founder wants that billion dollar valuation, you know, you can say, well, you're, you're not really worth that, but I'm going to put a liquidation preference and I'm going to get a multiple of my money back before you get distributions. And that's a way to kind of change the effective valuation. So there, there's a lot of kind of math and, and strategy that goes into this and structuring this on mm -hmm. both sides. Um, and it's just, you know, a bit of a chess game, I would say. So without going too long here. Speaking of chess, um, going to the next slide, you know, how do folks protect themselves, you know, from from various scenarios. Um, we talk about warrant coverage or, or warrants, and, and this can uh, allow uh, somebody who's, who's uh, putting in equity to um, get more equity if, if they're able to deliver certain value points uh, or if certain conditions happen. And so it's really a, a, a way to protect your, your upside. Uh, Co-sale and ROFR rights are, are designed to make sure that uh, if the, uh, the founders try and get out, that, that, that uh, the investors can take their, their money or go with them. And, and that's the same with drags and tags. Uh, typically, the investors want to be able to drag and, and they also want to tag. Um, and and uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, dividends can be structured similarly to uh, liquidation preferences where you either have one or you don't, whether it accrues or it doesn't, whether it compounds or it doesn't, and whether it participates or it doesn't. And I think the standard uh, in the market is that there is a dividend on preferred stock and it doesn't participate, it's not cumulative, and it doesn't accrue unless it's declared. Um, and so you, you're, you're going to want to make sure that that's the case. And if you get something different, we might call that a dirty term sheet in an early stage round. Um, and we see a lot of uh, investors from, well, I'll say out of area. Um, we used to see this uh, 10 years ago coming out of Asia, um, uh, where, um, you know, market practices that might be typical in other areas of the world to, to include things like ratchets, um, full ratchets uh, uh, to adjust for valuation or, or di will, would, would show up in a term sheet either in the liquidation preference or in the dividend section or in the conversion price. Uh, and we'd call that a dirty term sheet. Um, uh, I think it's, it's fair game in last mile term sheets, but in, in earlier you know, A and B rounds, that's not something you should see. Um, next is cost of counsel. And um, I, you know, I, I've often heard people say that 1% of the capital raise is kind of a, uh, a, something to, to think about in terms of cost of counsel. But as Nicole would tell you, uh, the amount of legal work is often uh, not commensurate with the, the stage and the amount of capital being raised. Um, um, and and uh, the NVCA in their term sheet uh, published uh, some data on this, and they said that a seed round should cost 20, and A should cost 30, and a B should cost 40, uh, and there's some other cost points, but obviously uh, I think those that's national data, and, and companies in Silicon Valley, New York, or Boston, uh, probably higher cost markets, um, you know, you might find um, higher numbers, but certainly capping the cost of counsel uh, for investors is something that companies always want to do. And, uh, but sometimes they for, forget to think about the cost of their own counsel uh, and, and uh, that can get out of hand uh, for a whole lot of reasons. And so getting good counsel early, um, using them uh, effectively, um, adopting a lot of technology enabled tools um, will, will really make this um, uh, a, a lower number. Um, uh, Vitaly, do you want to talk to us about later stage terms, you know, ratchets, lick prefs, and carve outs? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, just like dividends is, is much later, ratchets, you know, these are things that are tied to companies that are posting revenue. In practice, when we're talking about technology, venture funded companies, they play a different game. They don't play a game to get to profitability quickly, right? This is, again, something that I also tell first time entrepreneurs or people coming from large companies and starting startups. Um, you know, you're in a game of, of land grab and you don't necessarily need to show profit. You know, look at Amazon. They didn't show profit for like 15 years or Salesforce, you know, any of the big successful companies. It's, it's, uh, it's a game of reinvesting all of your gains into growing the business as large as possible, as quickly as possible. So in practice, dividends and ratchets uh, shouldn't really come into play. You're absolutely right. When we're talking about deals that are in Europe or in Asia, this does come up because those companies, uh, they try to make startups look a lot more like traditional businesses where their, their KPIs are really about profitability at relatively early stage. 
Whereas with startups, we're, we're trying to get to massive scale as quickly as possible. And um, all of these things, you know, without, again, you know, we're a little over time and I want to make sure we cover everything. Um, you know, these things come into play and how you calculate the dividends and ratchets, uh, you know, that's something that you should be discussing with your advisors and your, and your counsel. If, if these are new terms to you, then probably just don't worry about it just yet um, until you get there. So I would say that. I'm going to just, uh, make a last point on carve outs and, and oftentimes in later stage deals, either they're distressed. Um, so they need a little bit more capital to get to exit or it's a, it's a last mile uh, valuation that, that is designed to put a stake in the ground before you go out and go public. But if it's a distress round and, and new money's coming in and, and they're demanding a three X liquidation preference or somehow, you know, hurting the, the, the stack, you know, management can say, Hey, you know, a, fine to give you that, but, um, you know, the management team needs a, a minimum amount of, of consideration to, to bring this to an exit. And, and so you, the, the, the trade-off often for the, the multiple of, of liquidation preference is a management carve-out plan. Um, and then the argument is whether those folks are named or not named. Um, typically, they're not in, until exit. Uh, but obviously that doesn't give a lot of comfort to management who, um, you know, could be fired in the, in the, in the immediate term. Um, so, so um, that's just a word on, on a carve out plans. Um, yeah, yeah. Just on that real quick. I mean, it's one thing is, you know, as you go through these subsequent rounds, uh, a lot of times management team, the founding team could find themselves with a small single digit percentage of equity left in the company. And that's where you need to kind of make sure that they stay on board and they're interested. Otherwise they're kind of sold off the whole company and, they're sitting on a small salary and it's really not interesting for them. And they might be tired years into this just for practical purposes. They need some motivation to stay engaged and get the company to the finish line. So and worse than that, you know, the liquidation stack might be worth more than the, the company rendering their single digit common percentage zero. Uh, and that's um, that's when you really need a carve out plan. Last word is I see a lot of carve out plans in life science companies where the entrepreneurs have been diluted down so low and they've delivered such great value that, um, you know, preferred investors will do something for them on a carve out basis, either in a sale or even in an IPO to kind of give them some extra, you know, uh, kickers to, to keep doing what they're doing. So um, that's, uh, that's on that. Side letters are what we see from strategic investors who typically are, are going to come into one round. They're not going to do a pro rata. Um, they probably don't want a board seat. Uh, it's, it's a strategic, uh, thing for them. And, and so, uh, because they know that they're, they're not going to be monitoring everything they put in place a side letter so that they will be notified upon the occurrence of certain things and to kind of protect themselves on the downside. Um, a lot of people will tell you that, oh, you know, side letters are evil and bad. Uh, any corporate venture investor that gives you a side letter, throw them out. Uh, I disagree. I, I think that it, uh, it can be a constructive uh, part of your relationship and it might be the cost of doing business with a great uh, commercial partner uh, like a Samsung uh, or an LG or, or one of these big, uh, you know, investors, the uh, strategics that can really accelerate the growth of your company. Um, so, so, um, what you want to be careful of, however, is, is if it ha gives, gives away the right to acquire you or a notification that if you do get acquired or you have received an offer to be acquired, you've got to notify the strategic uh, and, and sometimes people can view the way those are worded as a cap on value because it would disincentivize a buyer from coming in and dropping in an offer because they'd know that it would be given, uh, or shared with, uh, an existing strategic investor. And so, um, I think that can be controversial and I understand why. Um, uh, those are my thoughts. Vital, you want to argue with me on that? Um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> so on the side letters, uh, not necessarily just for strategics. I mean, keep in mind, so two things. So for strategics, um, they're not typically investing for financial gain because even if you hit it out of the park for a company that produces 50 billion revenue a year, you're not going to move the needle on revenue, right? So even if you have a fantastic return, you know, 10X, 20X, whatever, on a small amount of money, they're not going to notice it. it's going to be rounding error, but they're investing to get information, to understand the market, to have optionality of working with their business groups and really turbocharging a multi-billion dollar business for them uh, or enabling strategy that's, um, that's, uh, that they're thinking of or contemplating on, you know, years down the road. So think of it uh, uh, from that perspective and that's their perspective. That's what, that's the role that I played for, for some time at HP. Um, the other time side letters are used is by smart investors that are investing at early stages. 
and it might be coming into a safe or convertible, but they want to have, for example, prorata rights uh, that are separately negotiated in a separate agreement. You know, a side letter is a separate agreement. And what that means is that if um, majority of the safe or convertible notes get kind of washed out and renegotiated and everybody votes okay, you still have your side letter as an investor to be able to uh, use as a negotiating pawn uh, down the road. And this is a way for you to protect your rights. You know, things like pro rata meaning you invest some money into the company and you have a chance to maintain your percentage of ownership. That's what pro rata means in later rounds. If you have the capacity and the company is really doing well, um, nobody's going to squeeze you out of the round. Even if you're a smaller investor, you know, uh, a major fund comes in and they usually want to buy, you know, all the shares they want, they want the whole round or nothing. And, and you, this is your opportunity to make sure that uh, you kind of have the opportunity to double down on the company if it's doing well. So um, not, not exclusive. Um, in the next slide, we have some of these other things you touched on. We, you know, the non-compete, uh, that's obviously for strategics. Uh, you know, the collaboration agreement, that's what the side letter might be called with a strategic. And that's where they might put in place or very, you know, very much will put in place and say that, you know, if you're doing business with us, we have the right to first refusal to do some kind of uh, partnership with you. Uh, if you get an offer to be acquired, right to first offer, uh, we have an opportunity to respond. And certainly we don't want you collaborating with our competitors. That's the reason why we're coming into the company in the first place. And we want to have all the strategic benefits out of this relationship. So that's something that you will most likely find in discussions with strategic investors. And yeah, I would say that um, if you do get a strategic investor that asks for some of these things, you know, your traditional venture capitalists will, will scream horror. Uh, but I think that there are ways to word these things so that it's a win-win such that, you know, if you just share that, that you received an offer um, without disclosing the name of the person or, or, or the amount, you know, that actually might, you know, stir the pot and, and contribute to others, uh, it, you know, coming into an auction process and bidding up the price. So, you know, I think there are ways to address these issues so that the uh, the new corporate venture investor is is comfortable and the existing investors uh, don't feel like there's a cap on value. So ha there's a happy medium, uh, uh, sometimes a tightrope uh, to walk, but I, I think it's doable. And, and uh, um, I spend a lot of time helping people uh, uh, bridge these gaps. Um, I, I appreciate we're 10 minutes after the hour, but we've got a lot of participants. And Kate, it looks like we've got quite a few items in the Q&A button, and I wondered if you wanted to take us through um, those in some order. Yeah, sure, Lou. Let me pick up the most interesting one. Um, so there is a question. Um, if I'm a new investor, why would I allow the option pool to be increased post-close uh, as I would be immediately diluted upon close? Uh, quickly, because uh, it, it won't be in the post money, it'll be in the pre money, um, and it's just a negotiated term. And and uh, if it's if it's not in the pre money, uh, that means that you've uh, agreed to a uh, a higher valuation uh, uh, for the company post money. Because to your point, it would dilute you. So uh, it should the option pool increase is normally in the pre money, and if it's in the post money, that just means uh, that you've uh, it, it negotiated a bigger pre money valuation. Uh, another question is, uh, how are independent board members are compensated? I'd love, Nicole, for you to chime in here, but I see independent board members coming in later stage. If they do come in early stage, I think they get a, a point of equity, maybe two points. Mm -hmm. um, it usually vests uh, monthly over two years with a single trigger change of control. I don't typically see any cash consideration for early stage companies for independent board members. Uh, but for later stage board members, uh, you know, you, that are independent. Sometimes there is a little bit of cash, but it, it's typically a very small amount. Um, you know, I, at the high end, I've seen 100,000, 125, 150,000 uh, for board members. And those are for really uh, large, you know, unicorn type of companies that need, that, that effectively operate like a public company uh, already. Um, and then in those cases, I don't see a, a full point of equity uh, being granted, but rather maybe some annual grant of of some nominal amount of shares uh, that when you put it together with a 49A valuation uh, equals uh, another $125,000. Um, that's typically what I see. Uh, sometimes if you bring on somebody who's a real needle mover, 
um, you know, they'll, they'll negotiate something uh, special. And by needle mover, I mean somebody who's just an industry uh, leader who just by virtue of their being on your board uh, gives you credibility or opens a door to a, a customer or a, a number or a channel. Uh, that's what I see. Nicole, anything to add there? No, I agree with that. Um, very rarely see cash um, cash compensation for early to mid stage companies. So and more um, and don't always see equity grants either. Um, but but definitely later stage companies is where you will find that. Yeah, when when um in the last round of of finance of private financings before an IPO, I'll typically see a company right after that put together start putting together a board with independents and, and uh, who are really, you know, luminaries and, and those people do need to be compensated. And, and I, and I do see that um, in, in those limited cases. Yeah. It's not a whole lot of work. Uh, Louis, maybe you want to flip to the last slide there while we're talking here. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, it's not a, it's not a whole lot of work. Uh, you know, think about it, it's a quarterly board meeting, uh, maybe a day of prep and a day long board meeting, some travel time if the people are remote. Um, and if it's not Zoom as it is now these days. Um, so it's not a whole lot of work, but these are expensive people with a lot of experience uh, who have their choice of where they spend their time. So uh, it has to come out in some way at the end, maybe equity ultimately, uh, you know, or maybe it's a favor or, you know, um, it's, it's going to be some kind of compensation at the end. Uh, but public, um, public board members, public company board members are the ones that uh, get compensated, you know, quite, quite higher. So. Another question we have is, uh, does the state law determine the information rights? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. State law plus the, uh, the contractual documents that are signed at the, at the financing. Next. Uh, another question is, what advice would you give to founders who want to accelerate options upon change and control? Oh, that's a great question, and, and Vitaly would love your thoughts, but most buyers, um, whether or not there's automatic uh, acceleration or it's, it's at the option of the board, uh, the sellers and their board will want to accelerate it, and the buyers will put in their term sheet that uh, you can't accelerate it because they want to take the benefit of, of the, uh, of the uh, retention value uh, to the to to the other side of the transaction, so it's a negotiated term uh, to be dealt with at the term sheet stage uh, before you sign exclusivity. Because once you sign exclusivity, you're you're not getting it. Uh, that's my experience. Vitaly, Nicole, I would add that uh, you know if you want some homework on this, watch the show Silicon Valley. Uh, there's lots <laughs> of things about this, like resting investing. Um, the important thing is dual trigger, double trigger, right, and how you negotiate that ultimately. Um, on the one hand, if the company is sold, um, they want to hang on to the management team to at least make the transition if that product is going to get absorbed into the buyer, um, or they, they stay on board and they're motivated to keep evolving and, and improving the product and, and getting to some particular milestone. On the other hand, if uh, you find yourself getting acquired and then your buyer then completely changes the strategy or defunds the company you know, marketing plan and you can't hit your goals and you can't vest, uh, you need to be able to tie that to that second trigger, right? Or if they move the company to the, the you know, the South Pole, that's obviously a second trigger where you won't be able to perform anymore on plan. And that's when you should be, you should have the right to get out and, and be fully accelerated and fully vested uh, with all the shares. So uh, pretty important. Uh, again, kind of, I would under, underline that uh, if you find yourself in the situation, this is, this is where your counsel will, um, both your bankers and your lawyers will will give you the benefit of their experience and will pay and that'll pay off handsomely because they will get you out of these potential situations down the road that you definitely don't want to find yourself in. Okay, Another next. question uh, yeah, that we have is uh, how would you advise on CFS issues when the fund is from the funds are from overseas, um, for example, uh, on technology classification review, uh, apply for approval prior to investing, etc. Um, so, so if you are an overseas investor, you absolutely need uh, CFIUS counsel. Period. Full stop. Uh, and you know how you invest uh, will be absolutely determined by your own strategy, your own risk tolerance, um, how expensive it'll be to get through the CFIUS. 
uh, and the amount of capital you're, you're and, and ownership stake that that you're looking for, and and obviously the 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 classification of of technology if it's on that list of 27 uh, areas of critical national security. So really important to to team up with a with a good CFIUS regulatory lawyer. Um, and Nicole and I work with a, a number of them, and and it's a uh, it's a it's a key uh, key member of the team if you're an overseas investor or if you're you're taking money from an overseas investor. Uh, one more question is uh, how exactly to clean up the cup table? And what does oh. it mean? Oh, that's a good one, um, Vitaly. You want to take that one, or or Nicole? Um, I'll, I'll take this one real quick and I have to jump off because I have uh, another meeting that just started. Um, so I would say, you know, it, that can mean a lot of different things, but generally speaking, you can have a very messy cap table with a bunch of convertibles and safes and things. And uh, ultimately you convert everybody. And in some cases where you're doing really well, you might have a big name brand investor that comes in and they want to buy out early investors. They also want to provide some liquidity to the management team to kind of take the uh, pressure off and, and let them buy a house or a car or whatever, because they've been working on this for a number of years, uh, kind of heads down. And, um, you know, that, that can mean many different things, but ultimately it just means simplifying the cap table and removing the number of different parties on there. Um, again, something that you don't really have to worry about until uh, you get to a certain place and, and you'll know it when you see it. So, um, with that, um, I, I, I unfortunately have to jump off, but I, I think there's uh, at least one more good question here. Um, so I want to thank everybody f for my, from, uh, on my behalf uh, for participating and my contact details are here. I would love to hear from you if you have any additional questions or are contemplating raising capital or selling your company. Uh, that's an area that we play in. So uh, thanks very much, Vitaly. And I think we're going to wrap it here. And, and uh, Nicole, uh, thank you so much for joining. Any parting words, Nicole, of advice? Yeah, feel free to, to reach out. Um, this was really fun. Thank you for having me. And it was great chatting with you guys. Kate, thanks as always for the awesome job setting this up and uh, the uh, reminder emails. Apologies to the uh, audience members who received so many of our emails, but uh, uh, we, uh, we appreciate the connect connectivity and, and uh, hope this is valuable and don't hesitate to reach out uh, with, uh, with thoughts or ideas about you know, how we could help you or, or future topics. Um, we will be posting the slides and circulating them and we'll be putting up a recording of the video on next jurist for lawyers who are looking for MCLE. You'll get credit if you watch it. And uh, for those of you who aren't lawyers, just find it on YouTube uh, in the next uh, 24 or 48 hours. Thanks again, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe uh, and see you in September. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.